Hi, I'm Jeff Cunningham, professor at Arizona State University, and I'm here this morning with legendary investor, philosopher, and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett. Good morning, Warren. Good morning. <laughs> My first question for you, I don't know if you've had a chance to Google yourself, but if you Google Warren Buffett, you get 25 million hits. And my question is, you're a sitting CEO, you're wealthier than Midas, but everybody thinks you're a champ. How do you do that? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, think, I think when you get older, they forgive a lot of things. So I think if I ever make it up to you know, George Burns' age or something, and I just have a cigar in my mouth, and <laughs> people, people will really love me then. <laughs> you're arguably the most interviewed CEO in history. Is it your ability to communicate that comes from instinct, or is it something you've learned over the years? Well, I certainly learned to speak in public at one time. I was terrified of speaking in public when I was in high school. I avoided any class that would require it, and, and in college. And then I finally signed up for a Dale Carnegie course. Uh, when I got out of school, I realized I had to talk to people. And I spent 100 bucks. I got this little diploma. I proposed to my wife during the, uh, during the uh, uh, term of the course, so I really got my money's worth there. But in terms of public speaking, I really had to force myself on that. In terms of talking privately, they couldn't stop me from the moment I started I, <laughs> in school or anything. I, I've always, I, I've always liked to talk. <laughs> How do you keep up with all the media and information that goes on in our crazy world and in your world of Berkshire Hathaway? What's your media routine? I just read and read and read. I probably read five to six hours a day. I don't read as fast now as, as when I was younger, but I read five daily newspapers. I read a fair number of of magazines, I read 10Ks, I read annual reports, and I read a lot of other things too. So I, I, I've always enjoyed reading. I love reading biographies, for example. Hint, you process information very quickly. Well, I have, I have some filters in my mind. So if, if somebody calls me about an investment in a business or an investment in securities, I usually know in two or three minutes uh, whether I have an interest. And I don't, I don't waste any time with the ones I don't, in which I don't have an interest. I, I always worry a little bit about even appearing rude because I can tell very, very, very quickly whether uh, it's going to be something that uh, will lead to something or whether it's, you know, it's just a half an hour, an hour, or two hours of chatter. When, uh, I think you wrote in an annual report, it was in 2009, speaking about the country, about the economy, uh, we are certain, for example, that the economy will be in shambles throughout this year. The problem was that wasn't the complete quote. It led the impression that you were unduly pessimistic about the country. Uh, how did you respond to that? Yeah, well, I wasn't at all pessimistic about the country. In fact, I wrote an, I wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times in October of 2008, just when the world was kind of falling apart. And I said, the, I said, the world is going to fall apart for a while, but don't worry about it. We're going to come out fine on the other side. And I said, buy stocks. And uh, uh, I've, I've never been pessimistic about the United States. I, I bought my first stock uh, in the spring of 1942. I was 11. and. If you remember, you you, would, you don't remember. <laughs> no one watching this will remember. But but we were losing the war at that time, and uh, we were getting we were we were getting uh, totally creamed in the South Pacific, and the Philippines fell, and the Death March at Bataan, and all that sort of thing. It was not until the Battle of Midway, which was a little later, that things started turning around. But I was optimistic on the country then. And I've been optimistic on the country ever since. And incidentally, the Dow Jones average then was 117,000. <laughs> it, it's no one has ever been a success betting against America since 1776, and they're not going to be a success in the future doing it either. I know when the Dow hit 1,000, it was a moment of euphoria. Yet, if I'm not mistaken, you plowed in and you even raised more funds. Has the Dow ever felt to you like it was way too frothy? There were <clears throat> a couple of times when it looked too frothy to me, but that's in 50 years. And, and you know, the, I wrote, I, I gave a talk in 1999, and it's gotten reprinted uh, in Fortune subsequently. And uh, th there have been a couple of times when it really looked to me like people had gotten too excited. But even then, I knew that the country would, you know, any, any, any marker that we'd established we were going to surpass later on. And, and that continues true to today. I mean, uh, this country's just getting started. I was reading a, a Lincoln quote the other day. Uh, With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. And of course, he was talking about what led to the Emancipation, Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, when I think about your world, 330,000 people who are employees of Berkshire Hathaway or its subsidiaries, how do you send a message 
that they are being scrutinized under the microscope by the media at all times? Well, I send a message to their managers. Uh, th those 330,000 people work for maybe 70 or so CEOs and in turn work for me. So I, I, my job is to have those 70, 70 CEOs sending out the right message. So every two years, I write them a very simple letter. It's a page and a half. I don't believe in 200-page manuals because if you put out a 200-page manual, everybody's looking for, uh, for loopholes, basically. But page and a half, it's very hard for them to <laughs> argue about what I'm talking about. So I tell them, uh, you know, that my reputation, Berkshire's reputation is in their hands. And not only, and we've got all the money we need. We'd like to make more money, but we've got all the money we need. We don't have an, uh, an ounce of reputation beyond what we need, and we can't afford to lose it. So we never will trade reputation away for money. And, and they're the ones that are the guardians of that, and that uh, I want them to not only do what's legal, obviously, but I want them to judge every action by how it would appear on the front page of their local paper written by a a smart but semi-unfriendly reporter, you know, who really understood it, to be read by their family, their neighbors, their friends, and it, it has to pass that test as well. And I tell them I don't want anything around the lines. I tell them there's plenty of money to be made in the center of the court, and I'm 84 and my eyes aren't that good anymore. I can't quite see the lines that well. So just keep it in the center of the court, and if they have any questions, call me, you know. Even the occasional dust-up at Berkshire there will be. Is, is big news. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll I'll pick on Solomon only because it's history yeah, now, and a, good a, lot, a lot of time to reflect on that. Um, when you think about what you went through there, what advice do you have for a CEO who's on the media hot seat because of a similar situation? Well, there's there's a couple pieces of advice on that. Uh, the first is that when you find out a bad no bad news, correct it, and if it's necessary to report it, then the authorities report it immediately. The big problem with Solomon was not what a fellow named Mosier did, which was to defy the U.S. government. Not ever a very good idea, but that could have been handled, but he reported, it, it, he didn't report it. John Merriweather, his supervisor, uh, picked up on it in late April of 1991 and went to the president and the chairman and the chief legal counsel of, of Solomon and said, here's what this fellow Mosier's been doing. And they all agreed it was wrong. They all agreed it was reportable to the Federal Reserve promptly. And unfortunately, nobody did anything. And then. In the middle of May, Mosier went out and did it again, and now you've got a terrible problem because you knew a, the guy was a bad actor uh, a few weeks earlier and you hadn't reported it, and now that compounded there, and then you're in a, you're in a real pickle. So when you, when you find bad news, you know, my, I say get it right, get it fast, get it out, get it over. And get it right is important. There wasn't any question that Mosier had done it there, but the get it fast and get it out, they, they missed on. And so, Deal with bad, you're going to get bad news. I mean, I got 330,000 people. I mean, I, I will guarantee you that probably dozens of them are doing something wrong right now. And I just hope I find out about it early and the person below me finds out and lets me know if it's bad enough and that they stop it. So you can't have a city of 330,000 without an occasional <laughs> crime of some sort. Uh, so it's going to happen. and. You've got to do something about it fast uh, when it does happen. I know you're acquainted with the concept that journalists write the headlines before they do the story. What's your advice for this situation? For instance, Walmart pays fewer than 6,000 of its 1.3 million employees the minimum wage. Right. But the headline is, unions decry minimum wage policies at Walmart. How do you solve that? It's very tough because <laughs> it's a better story from the standpoint of the writer, and particularly the headline writer. Uh, it, uh, the second story is a better story than the first story. And uh, the biggest sin in journalism that I see, and I, and I think incidentally, I think I probably as a CEO have spent more time talking to journalists than perhaps any CEO in the country. Partly that's because I'm 84, but partly because I like to talk to journalists too. But the, the greatest sin they commit You've got to start a story with a hypothesis. I mean, you're looking into something because you have a working hypothesis, but you have to give up that hypothesis if it turns out not to be correct or if, it, or if it's misleading in a major way. So uh, I always worry about the journalist that calls me. They've decided what story they're working on, and all they're looking for is confirmatory evidence. So I call it quote shopping. They'll talk to me for 45 minutes hoping they get one quote that confirms their story and ignoring the other 43 minutes while I tell them things that should limit the, the story. So it's, it's very natural. You know, you get time invested in it, you've got this working hypothesis, 
you know, terrible what Walmart does with their employees or whatever it may be. And you may have some people who, who have an interest in it feeding you a lot of material along that line. And once you've invested a lot of hours and your editor knows you've invested a lot of hours, maybe it was the editor's working hypothesis to start with. Now, now you now you got to go back and tell him he's wrong or her. I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of momentum uh, toward a bad story. There's a lot of momentum toward a good story too. But but you have to you have to you have to be able as a writer to say my hypothesis is no longer correct. And all it was was a hypothesis. That's no sin to say that, but it's hard to do. You're referring to what almost feels like ego on the part of the journalist. But there's also the question of an anti-business bias, and I'll just pick on a headline. Billions of penalties later, Diamond, the chairman of J.P. Yeah. Morgan, gets a raise. But the truth was that there were billions of penalties, there were fines, there were cuts in salary, the company was turned around, and the salary was restored. Is that too much of, to ask of a headline writer? Well, I always worry about the headline writers. Of course, the reporter always says, well, I don't write the headlines. And I ask reporters occasionally, I say, you may not write the headline, but before the story runs, you should at least be okay with the headline. I want you to be able to tell me after the story runs that you were okay with the headline, because the headline is what 10 times as many people are going to carry around in their mind later on as the story. So don't tell me you're absolved of everything because you don't write the headline. And good reporters will do that, incidentally. Uh, they don't write the headlines, I, I, you know, I know that. But they, if, if they feel the headline misrepresents their story, then they've got an obligation uh, to complain to the editor. Uh, but going back to the diamond example, I mean, you know, most of the things that J.P. Morgan got penalized for were acts at WAMU, which they took over, or Bear Stearns, which they took over. At the time they took over those two institutions, the United States government was on their knees begging them to do it, basically, through the various agencies. I mean, they, they were doing a, something that was a public service. That doesn't mean they didn't think they'd benefit by it, but they were, they were totally following through on something that the government wanted ha to have happen very badly. And they picked up, unfortunately, they wrote those contracts very fast and they picked up the sins of those organizations which they had nothing to do with. Now, that doesn't mean that J.P. Morgan hasn't gotten fined for some things they did as well. But overwhelmingly, uh, those were huge fines from the past. And when, when a fine wants, when the government wants to levy a fine, you just salute and smile and say, do it again, you know, basically. Uh, we got fined $290 million at Solomon. If the figure had been $100 million, if it had been five hundred, there was nothing I could do about it. I had to agree to it. And that's just the way it is. Uh, so it's, it can be a little tough. And I would, uh, I, uh, Jamie Dimon runs a, has done a terrific job of running J.P. Morgan. It was very fortunate for the United States uh, citizens that, that Jamie Dimon was running J.P. Morgan during the financial panic. It is true that one reason, we won't necessarily call it haste, but one reason for urgency was the companies they were buying were melting down. They were gone. <laughs> They'd already melted down. They, they may not have known it, but they were gone. And, and, and they were important institutions. And WAMU came along right after Wachovia, after Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and all, the dominoes were toppling. And here was another very big domino and the FDIC could have taken it on, but that would have, that, that, there were a lot of problems connected with that, and J.P. Morgan stepped up. The FDIC did get, get involved, but believe me, the panic of 2008 would have been far worse if J.P. Morgan hadn't been there and Jamie Dimon hadn't been running it. There's a media example that hits a little closer to home. You were quoted as being very interested and dramatically changing your opinion on a compensation issue but that you didn't divulge it to the board. I'm wondering if that was just a misquote or bad fact checking. I disagreed with the level of, of options being authorized, which the Coca-Cola company stated in the proxy material would likely be issued within four years. I thought it was excessive. Uh, I abstained from voting. Uh, I announced my abstention after the vote. I did not want to be leading a proxy contest or anything of the sort. I have, I think the management of, of Coca-Cola is first class. I think they've got some difficult problems to take on, but I think they've got some tremendous assets working for them as well. And I thought that, uh, I thought they're very decent people, and I thought if they were reasoned with and talked to that they might well change things, and they have. I mean, they've dramatically changed 
that plan so that instead of over four years, it'll be over 12 years. Well, that's cutting it by two thirds. The chairman of the compensation committee is, is a very first class person, very smart. She picked up on all the points on it and, and they made the changes. So the abstention accomplished something very significant for Coca-Cola shareholders. Uh, the, board of, the board of Berkshire wasn't involved with it. I mean, basically, uh, we talked about it afterwards and, and, and they approved of both the abstention and, and, uh, and my suggestions to the Coca-Cola board. There was criticism that you only abstained in the media. Yeah. Yours was what I would call the abstention heard round the world. That reflects a lack of understanding of the boardroom on the part of many journalists, does it not? It really does. I mean, the look at what we've accomplished by the abstention. You know, we've we've still we're the largest shareholder of Coca-Cola. We want to be the largest shareholder of Coca-Cola. We want to be helpful to Coca-Cola. They want to do the right thing. Uh, I mean, there there is no basic conflict at all between us and the Coca-Cola company. In fact, there's admiration on my part for the Coca-Cola management. I thought they made a mistake in doing what they were doing, and uh, the abstention has worked out uh, in terms of vastly changing the plan. And voting no and, and creating a ruckus would be a very a, been a very dumb thing. It would accomplish nothing. They would have dug in their heels, in all likelihood, that's human nature. Uh, it might have been more fun for the press, <laughs> but it wouldn't have accomplished the goal. People, people they like, they, they, they don't really under, I mean, you're dealing with a human institution. These are decent, high-grade human beings as directors, and I hadn't talked with them about the, the plan. I was not a director. My son was a director, but I wasn't a director. I did not know they were going to say that they were authorizing those shares to be issued over four years. When I read it, I thought it was a mistake. And what should I do? Should I start condemning all these people, the Coca-Cola, telling the world they're terrible people? They're not terrible people. What I should do is convey my feelings to them. And I, I'm not going to vote for it and then talk to them afterwards. I mean, this was shortly before the annual meeting, but I did abstain. And, and then I talked to them, and now we've got a very sensible plan. And, and you know, no personal relationships have been damaged. People do not feel they've got an enemy out there, which they don't have. It just makes sense in terms of human behavior. But it would have been a better story if, you know, if I'd <laughs> taken out ads or something and said this is the worst thing that's happened <laughs> in history. The journalist's pet peeve, of course, is the banks, if, as we've been discussing. Uh, they see headlines where Bank of America has to pay $18 billion in penalties, and the follow-up is, why isn't anyone going to jail? Why is it that journalists look at business results as a crime to be punished? Well, I think that <clears throat> there, there have been individuals do things in business that they should go to jail for, and they, and they, they have, and sometimes they should, and they haven't gone to jail. But there's, there's two different, there are corporate sins. I mean, it, take the Solomon situation. Uh, the fellow that committed the original act, I think he went to jail for four months. I mean, he, he is the guy that caused our problems. but. The second problem was not reporting it. Now, did you send somebody to jail for that or something? I don't think so. You penalized the company big time. I don't think you put them out of business or anything of the sort. And we paid a big price for the, for the fact that, that Moser's actions were not reported to the Fed in a timely manner. It was important that the company uh, pay that fine and that we acknowledge the fact that that was a very wrong thing to do. You don't go around and sell the United States government on its regulations for selling U.S. bonds. But for an action, I think Mosher probably should have gone away for a lot longer period, but I may be biased on that. But I don't think other people should have. And, and you just have to make a determination about when the activity of some individual is criminal, I think, you know, they, they should be, they should be, uh, 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 prosecuted, uh, but every time a something goes wrong at the corporate level, we've had things go wrong at the corporate level. There, I, I will promise you that in the next five years, something will happen at Berkshire that is, is the wrong thing for the somebody at the corporation, the corporation to do. I mean, I, you know, and we'll correct it, but it's going to happen from time to time, and. Uh, I don't think I should <laughs> go to jail if one of our 330,000 people does something they shouldn't do. But we're, in a sense, we're speaking of two sides of the same coin. The first one was the abstention where journalists don't understand the boardroom, in a sense, and how it works. They, they don't participate in it. The, the second one is a misunderstanding of civil versus criminal law. 
it's not only a journalist issue, it's, it's a country issue. Is there something we can do to better educate journalists? Should they be taking sabbaticals and working for Berkshire for six months or a year? Wouldn't be a bad idea. The, the, you know, it is very tough that, uh, you know, that uh, I, I quoted uh, Mickey Mantle one, uh, saying uh, one time that it's amazing how easy this game is once you get up in the press box. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and there is that problem. They, of course, at the Washington Post, they used to say, you don't have to be dead to write obituary. So it isn't necessary that you have experience in everything to write about it. But, but the, if you're going, particularly if you're going to be a business journalist or a political journalist, you really should understand business. And going back to our boardroom example, boardrooms, boards are social, and social organizations as well as having business responsibilities. But it's very important to understand how human beings act and, and, and uh, I've been on 19 boards. I mean, I, I can tell you that most journalists probably, and most Americans, and maybe, maybe many, uh, you know, many people that write about business, they really don't understand the dynamics within a boardroom. Uh, and, and, and it's a little hard for journalists to be planted in boardrooms around the country, but I do think that business journalists, well, A, they have to understand accounting. You can't write about business without understanding accounting. And I run into a lot of journalists that really don't understand accounting, and that's that's too bad. It's just that's the language of business, and and that's important to understand. Uh, the best business journalist I've known has been Carol Loomis, and she didn't she didn't start out knowing anything about business, but she wanted to learn, and she is smarter at the end of every day than she is at the start of the day. Not very many people even say that about, but she just wanted. She learned about accounting. She learned about about all aspects of business, and as a result, she became the best business writer in the United States, or maybe the world. You know that uh, Jim Michaels, my former editor at Forbes, and I were talking one day about Carol Loomis. I will say this for Carol. I've seen her start stories and find out that she was wrong in her working hypothesis, and, and she, she wrote according to the facts that she found out, and uh, she was very good at finding out facts, very diligent, and that's why she wrote relatively few per year, but any story she wrote, you were going to learn something by reading, a lot by reading. The world of journalism and media has changed, and it, it's reflective of the world that Carol represented, the detailed, long-form story. Uh, content today is a commodity, and I'd first like to ask if the fact that it's a commodity had something to do with, I'll qualify it as your change of heart about the Washington Post and your interest in media general. I wouldn't say it changed it too much. I mean, it, it, the Washington Post uh, was selling uh, the newspaper, basically, and, and that, that changed my forever commitment to it. And I also felt that I wouldn't be running Berkshire someday, and this would be a, a, uh, a smaller commitment that they us we would usually make to marketable securities. And there was a very logical uh, deal that could be worked out to redeem our shares that would be good for both the company and for, for Berkshire. So uh, it was not really my feeling about newspaper journalism. The Washington Post was getting out of the newspaper business. Uh, uh, we were getting into it more at about the same time. The newsstand is becoming social media in some respects. If you look at these numbers, they sound like a Berkshire deal. 1.1 billion, that's the number of visitors Facebook gets per month. 900 million is the number of visitors Google gets per month. So news is seen now through the filter of what our friends think is interesting. Yeah. Everybody's does, a reporter. How does that play out for us? Well, it's, it, it's really changed the world big time, and you can see it, you know, in newspaper, daily newspaper circulation in the United States. I guess there's maybe 1,400 or so daily papers left. There were 1,700 not so long ago. and their numbers are going to go down, and their circulation is going to go down, and, and, and uh, their earnings are going to go down. So it, it is the print daily newspaper is, you know, it's been in decline for some period. It's going to continue in decline, and people, people with their computers, you know, with, with their mobile phones, whatever it is, they, they get things instantly. I mean, I used to have to wait till the next day to look at the box score of you know, what the Cardinals did the night before and, you know, find out how musical it hit and everything. And now I can go to ESPN.com and, you know, I'll get it play by play. So it, the world has really changed and people are, you know, they have, they tot they have gotten used to and demand instant, instant reporting, basically. And that means that they get a lot of stuff before the facts are out, but it means they get the facts very quickly, too. 
they can get their they can get their financial news much faster now than when they waited to the next day to see where their stocks had closed. <laughs> There's a silver lining you may not be aware of. Social media, the, the, the big play right now is Twitter for news yeah. organization. Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway alone are 39 characters in a 140 character tweet. <laughs> but your partner, Charlie Munger, is primarily grunting, and so he only takes up two or three characters. He's a valuable asset in the social media He's world. He's essential. <laughs> the key to our communication strategy. <laughs> I, I still love long form journalism. You can argue that a 10K is a, you know, really long form journalism, and uh, that's how I get my information. How does Berkshire deal with social media, or do you ignore it? We, we pretty much ignore it. Uh, we, we, uh, if you look at our web page, for example, I mean, we, didn't, we came up with it 20 years ago. It's the same thing. We, it, it actually represents what we are. Now, we communicate with our shareholders more than any other company that I know of. I mean, we, I've just gotten through re writing the 2014 annual report, 20,000 words. And those are my words. They're not some investor relations department or public relations department. They're not part of a sales document. We fell on our face in one respect last year, and I talk about it. I, I try to write that as exactly as I would write it to my sisters, assuming that they had virtually all of their net worth in Berkshire. They were interested in it, but they didn't follow it day by day. And they want to know what I think and what went wrong and what's going right and how I think the world will develop and a whole bunch of things. So we want to communicate directly with people. and. I really feel that if, if, if you want to talk to people honestly about a subject in which, which they care about, certainly they care about their money, they'll listen. I mean, I, I do not worry about the number of words when I write that report. I worry about telling them the things I'd want to know if our positions were reversed and they were telling me about my investment. In some respects, you anticipated the social media world. You mentioned earlier in, in our conversation uh, the page and a half memo that you send to your, your yeah. leadership every two years. The, the operative term today is TLDR, too long, didn't read. And you understood that if things were too long, people wouldn't read it a long time ago. So in some respects, you're, you've, you've seen where social media is going and you anticipated it. Well, perhaps, but I, uh, I, I, want to, I also want to make it short, because there's really only a few fundamental ideas I want to give those managers, and I want to make sure that they don't get lost on page 83 or something of the sort. I, uh, uh, it, people usually can't absorb <laughs> 15 or 20 <laughs> messages. Uh, but in terms of writing about Berkshire or talking about it, I, I, I feel we want to give people every bit of information that I would like to receive if I were on the other end. It reminds me, I, I uh, spent some time with Mark McCormick, who was the founder of IMG, the sure. famous sports management sure. company. But you didn't learn at the Harvard Business School. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yale Law School, though. Yeah. Uh, he, he put a contract together, and his, uh, his legal team got back to him, and he sent back a note with crayon on the top. This is too over-lawyered. Get it back to me in one page. And this is coming from a lawyer. Do you find that we're over-lawyered these days in communications? <laughs> I'm in closing in our annual report this year, the one-and-a-half-page contract we used to buy national indemnity for $8.6 million. National Indemnity now is the largest insurance company in the world by net worth, and it was one and a half pages. Uh, we've had one-page contracts for other companies. I can't seem to pull this off anymore. I mean, uh, I, I tell, I, I send these one-pagers out to our lawyers and say, let's get it down to this and let's get it done by next week. But the world seems to change on that. I still, I, I still go, would go for the one-page contract. You know, that, uh, I like to deal with people where I feel a one-page contract will do the job. If I have to have 50 pages in there uh, to protect me against the guy I'm dealing with, I'll always wonder whether I needed 51. <laughs> Just as an aside, I think National Indemnity was your first foray into the insurance business. It's a deal that you chased, and I believe you overpaid for it. Well, I, 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 will have, I, I, I hope the seller feels that way. <laughs> Who were the greatest business editors, do you feel, in the time that you've been observing the scene? And in their passing, have we lost something? Jim Michaels was an incredible editor. I mean, I mean he, could, you know, he could put out the whole magazine. And he proved every, every story he, 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 he edited, and he edited them all. It was improved by his touch. Uh, uh, Barney Kilgore was a sensational editor. I mean, he envisioned a world defined by interest rather than by geography. So he took a daily newspaper and said, I'm, I'm not trying to make this interesting 
you know, because you live in Omaha or you live in, you live in Peoria, I'm going to make it interesting because you live in the city of business. And he created, you know, a fantastic uh, uh, paper. Uh, uh, ben Bradley was a, a great editor, not a business editor, but, but he, was a, he was a great editor. But, uh, uh, I think you'll see other great editors in the future. Uh, I, you know, the, 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 the talent required for being a great editor has not been extinguished now. So maybe the, the formats have been reduced to which that editor can apply his talents or her talents, but, but I think you'll see other great ones. Do you think in terms of the media we're going through a transitional era and we'll end up in a rational place, or will we see pictures of movie stars, selfies, and cats on the front page of the New York Times? I don't think we'll see them on the front page of the New York Times, but we'll see them every place else. Uh, uh, people, you know, that's why People Magazine was, People Magazine, became the most profitable magazine in the, in, you know, maybe in the world, certainly in the United States, and by uh, quite a margin, you know, Fortune magazine was still <laughs> turning out things that I love to read, but, but, uh, but it was people that sold. Uh, uh, no, I, unfortunately, I think the great majority of people are going to like things very, very brief. They're going to like personalities, I'm, you know, that's, but there will be people also that, that care about more in-depth journalism. I was reading uh, Robert Redford was quoted uh, that he created Sundance because the studios were doing things for the young kids, Transformers and science fiction, and he wanted a place to do independent movies. Do you think the same thing applies to the media in the examples that you just gave, that there'll be an independent flourishing? Well, I, I, there will be first-class journalism in, in, in institutions devoted to that or publications devoted to that and uh, there there is a big enough market for that it's not where most of the money will be and money will drive what what the public sees any parting advice for before the end of our interview for the journalism student I think it's wonderful I, if, I, if I didn't do what <clears throat> I do in my life I would want to be a journalist. I mean, I consider myself a journalist to some extent. I assign myself a story. I say, is the Washington Post Company worth $22 a share in 1973? I say, you know, is the Ber BNSF Railroad worth us paying $34 billion? I assign myself the story. It's my working hypothesis that it is. But then I go and look for the facts, and I try not to be selective about the facts that I, that I use as input. Uh, so journalism. It's fascinating, uh, uh, you know, it, I love it. Uh, I would say that, A, you should always observe that rule about not letting the hypothesis determine the story. B, you've got to learn, you've got to learn about accounting, you've got to learn about how business works if we're talking about business journalism. And you can always get smarter. And if you do the right kind of a job, you will attract the right kind of sources. I mean, I, I, you know, I am a source for certain journalists, and the reason I am is because I admire their work, and you know, the others get no place with me. So it, it, it's very important to, if you want to become a great journalist, you know, to be, to behave like one as you go along, and then all the other pieces will, will fall into place. Uh, and you want to have a curiosity about business. You know, there. There are so many good stories that haven't been written yet, a <laughs> few of which I know. And, and so it is, you couldn't be working in a better area. And uh, there's always going to be business. Business is always going to be important to the body politic as well as be interesting to, to a lot of readers. And, and, and if there are so few that are good that you're going to stand out if you really work at it. One last question. You're expecting 40,000 at this year's annual meeting? I wouldn't be surprised if we topped that, yeah. <laughs> this is this is your own social media <clears throat> gathering, you know that. You've become, the annual meeting has become a media frenzy, yet you've managed to maintain a common touch. Do you attribute that secretly to your ukulele playing? <laughs> no, I, I, I think I attribute the fact that I promised the crowd I won't play the ukulele, that's why they come. <laughs> Story.